It's a delight to have you with us. We've had two very interesting guests today, and we've got one more to uh, feature. Today is August 19th, National Aviation Day. So isn't it appropriate that we have a plane time broadcast on National Aviation Day, honoring all those pioneers who've gone before us and the ones that will continue after us in the, in the um, activity we know as aviation. So uh, before we get any further, I wanted to at least acknowledge the folks that uh, helped make this broadcast possible. In, in addition to, in addition to um, the folks that you see up here on, on screen, we have a host of people that are behind the cameras, working the cameras. Three cameras today, Bob and uh, uh, John, and I uh, can't see the other one. Sophie's back there, Melody's back there. Uh, Rich is uh, taking photos. We've got technical directors, John and uh, Mike, and Obi, our producer, of course. And uh, Bill is the other camera director, now I remember. So there's a lot of folks that make this happen. New York Dave is also here, parting, uh, doing his part in this. So we've got a lot of folks making this happen. I want to just at least acknowledge them. So our third guest today is uh, Dr. George Bartuska. And I'm not going to dispense with a long introduction because he has a pedigree that is very long, but he's known as the weather guy, and he's been with us a number of times before, giving us his interesting insights, building up on our knowledge of weather so that we can make more appropriate uh, decisions in, in safety with, with pilots. The topic today is hurricanes, and how apropos is that? Because we are now in hurricane season from June 1 through November in, in Florida. And, uh, George, I see that there's a hurricane bearing down on Southern California in the Pacific, also known as a typhoon, you told me, and uh, three or four disturbances in the Atlantic and the, and the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, do we need to be worried about hurricanes? I'll bet you're going to tell us all about it. George, why don't you take it away and uh, lead us through some interesting information on hurricanes, please. Okay, thank you, Ron. Uh, yes, today is August 19, 2023. There's not only a hurricane uh, in the uh, Pacific turning in towards Baja, California, but there are four disturbances out in the North Atlantic right now. You may remember last time I was here, we talked about thunderstorms. And that's good because you don't get a th hurricane without a thunderstorm. And since I was here last time, there's been two new developments in hurricane science that are, that are gonna give us a lot more information that we didn't have before. The first thing I wanna do when I get the slide to change. The first thing I want to do is talk about the occurrence of these. There we go. The first thing I want to do is put you at rest. There are 80 to 90 tropical cyclones a year on planet Earth, but that's all over the planet. And what uh, tropical meteorologists really don't know is why there aren't more. But of those 80 to 90, only about on the average of six affect the coastline of the United States every year. But we need to understand, well-developed tropical cyclones are relatively rare. The required simultaneous uh, preconditions are also relatively rare. But the necessary elements and conditions for the formation are quite common uh, over many parts of the tropics. In other words, atmospheric conditions have to be just right for a hurricane to form. Now, you probably wonder, how do we know what we know about hurricanes? And isn't it interesting that aviation has played a great part? Uh, back in 1943, a proficient instrument rated an instrument training pilot named Joseph Duckworth flew for the first time an airplane into a hurricane and back out again. And he flew between four and 9,000 feet. And that's going to be important as we go along, because if he had flown a little bit lower, he probably wouldn't have come out again. Uh, and that was 1943 in Galveston. Since then, there have been a number of projects over the years since, since 1943, and probably a, a dozen different aircraft have been used. The main one is the B-29 was used in a program. The DC-6 uh, DC was used and the uh, 140, sorry, the 121, yeah, the Lockheed 121 Electra. These were all aircraft used extensively, especially when, as we refined radar at the end of World War II. Today, and since the mid-70s, we use the, for the NOAA research part, we use two uh, Lockheed Electra P3, converted P3 Orions, uh, all the 
instrumentation that would have been on them originally for searching for submarines was removed and it was changed to have instrumentation looking for hurricanes or looking at hurricanes. It has radar in the nose, which is your typical of, uh, avoidance radar, but it has radar at 5.59 centimeter wavelength under the belly of the front of the aircraft and on the tail it has dual Doppler radar at 3.22 centimeter so it can take dual Doppler uh, swaths as it's flying near or through the hurricane. Now in addition to the P3 there are drop sounds which is kind of like a sauna buoy that we used to use for looking for submarines but a drop sound is dropped and it's the act, exact opposite action of launching a weather balloon. With a weather balloon we're launching a a uh, radio sound, we call it, to go up with a helium or hydrogen filled balloon. If we dropped anything like that near a hurricane, there'd be so much wind, it would blow it off somewhere, and we probably wouldn't get the data we want. But by dropping the drop sound, we can get the data. We're also using drones launched both from land and from the hurricane hunter. And as of 2022, we're using this orange thing that is a sail drone. It's an autonomous, unmanned robot, basically, a drone that's on the surface of the ocean that has a really heavy-duty counterweight. So you, you'll see later, it has taken the first video footage directly under the eye wall of a hurricane. We're also using gliders like a Slocum glider, floaters that go up and down, and drifters, both that go with the currents of the water and go with the air currents. Now, the, the uh, P-3s are the research aircraft the operational aircraft are supplied by the Air Force Reserve. There's 10 of these C-130s that fly out of Keesler Air Force Base in Biloxi, Mississippi, and all the crews are volunteers and they're all retired, they're all, um, they're all reserve, and most of the uh, reserve pilots are active duty airline pilots. And these are some of the pictures they get. And that's a C-130 flying over the top of the eye in a hurricane, and in the background you see the eye wall. Now, as aviation, this is the Florida Aviation Network, we're concerned about hurricanes, primarily what damage they can do to our aircraft and they can do to us. Because unless you're in the military, you're not gonna be flying in a hurricane. This, these are the remnants of about three F-16s were damaged by Hurricane Andrew in 1992 in, uh, in Homestead Air Force Base. Now, who's at risk? Now, this, our, our presentation goes out through the internet, so anybody in the world can be watching this, but we're here in Orlando, Florida. In the United States, it's primarily the coastal areas that might be affected by a hurricane, but a hurricane is not a tornado. It's two to 500 miles in diameter, and it can affect all these coastlines from Texas all the way up to Maine, and notice, even though you're not gonna get tornadic winds where the blue is, you're gonna get a lot of water, and I'm gonna be talking about that. Now, if you're not in the United States, understand that what we call a hurricane is really a tropical cyclone, meteorologically speaking. Like I said, there's 80 to 90 of them a year. We call them hurricanes. In the Pacific, they're known as typhoons. In the, in the uh, Australia area, they refer to them as cyclones. And worldwide, by the maritime services and some of the airlines, they call them uh, tropical ro rotating storms. But these are the paths where they're affected. Now, normally in the tropics, most of the time, it actually does look like this. It's great. That's why everybody comes here on vacation. However, what are the main impacts from a hurricane? The worst one is usually referred to as storm surge. I like to call it coastal storm surge because if you're not on the coast or in a water inlet, you're not gonna be affected. We're not gonna have storm surge in Orlando, Florida, but you will in Miami or Tampa or as we learned last year in Fort Myers. Uh, and I'm gonna go into that a little bit later. Next thing is the inland flooding. That her, a typical hurricane can carry 59 billion gallons of water. Think about the buoyancy. I don't have any math in my presentation, but think about the buoyancy required to hold 59 billion gallons of water in the air. Well, once the hurricane makes landfall, even though it stops being a hurricane, it's going to get rid of that water somewhere. And so inland flooding is a real problem. Now, the, the next thing is high winds. I'm originally from Indiana. If you showed me this picture and told me it was from Indiana, I'd tell you, oh, that was a, that was a uh, F3 uh, tornado. 
Exactly, but this wasn't a tornado. This was just high winds. Tornado gives us 125 to 200 mile an hour winds in a matter of seconds and does a tremendous amount of damage. But a hurricane gives us that same amount of wind for hours at a time. So the, this is the damage, just an example of the damage from winds. And we do in the outer rain bands get some tornadoes sometimes, and certainly we're gonna have damage from tornadoes. Now, as I said, probably the most studied hurricane to date is Hurricane Andrew, because there was so much information captured about it, and it's still the worst hurricane to ever have hit the state of Florida. Uh, uh, they readjust the damage. I think the last numbers I saw were $35 billion in damage. Um, but understand, all of our information now comes from satellites, land-based radar, aircraft-based radar, weather balloons, and drop sounds and radio sounds. Here's a, here's a picture that anyone who lives in Florida or in the coastline has probably seen before. A tropical cyclone is a rotating vortex. It's uh, with or organized deep convection and a closed surface circulation around a well-defined center, and it originates over tropical oceans and is driven principally by heat transfer from the ocean, and that's what we're gonna talk about. No hot water, no hurricane. Now let's look at the structure. The eye wall is the most recognized feature of the storm, and it is one of the oldest phenomena known in meteorology. Most people watching me right now have probably seen a, a her, picture of a hurricane from a satellite or other artist's conception in a book, and you've seen the eye wall. But what's underneath all that cirrus cloud shield at the top, up around 50,000 feet? Well, we see it looks like a conic structure, and that's the, uh, that's the main eye wall, and then we have rain bands around the outside. Now, so let's start at the eye, since it's the most recognized uh, part of the hurricane. It's the storm's axis of rotation. It isn't always circular, but it's usually mostly circular. It's calm in the center of the eye. It's usually free of high clouds. Um, it's clear to scattered at the low area. It's 20 to 40 miles in diameter, has exceptionally low air pressure. Before, uh, before we had satellites, the only way we could look at a hurricane is with a recording barometer as far as any data, and we would get this trace on the recording barometer as far as what the pressure was inside. And there's a saying, the smaller the eye, the more intense the hurricane is, because it's, uh, I'll, it's contracting, I'll go into that. Another picture here, now we're looking once again over the top of the eye and looking at the eye wall. Next from, that, from the eye is the eye wall. This is the heart of the hurricane. It's made of the short segments of monstrous thunderstorms similar to mature mesoscale convective systems. In other words, the, most people think the hurricane is some unique structure in itself. It's made up of large thunderstorms, all of it. Um, we have, and we have inward and upward spiraling winds. Uh, vertical, the whole thing is either straight or slanted out. I'm gonna show you that in a minute. And the, here's the thing, the fiercest winds are at 1,500 to 3,000 feet. So the hurricane hunters are never flying in lower, say, than 5,000 feet. And as I mentioned, uh, Colonel Duckworth said he flew in at uh, three to 9,000 feet. He was lucky he was above that because nobody knew at that time where anything was. And notice the typical winds are 115 to 150 miles an hour. I haven't done, um, I think I mentioned tornadoes the last time I was here, but understand before uh, Ted Fujita in the 1970s and 1980s, nobody really knew what the wind speeds were in a tornado. They guessed they were 600 to 900 miles an hour. But Dr. Fujita took a 16 millimeter movie of a tornado, I believe it was in Oklahoma City, and by by piecing it frame by frame in the movie, he figured out the wind speeds were no more than 125 miles an hour, which is something we can deal with if, when we're designing a structure. Under, in addition to these intense winds inside the eye wall, underneath the eye wall, we have uh, excessive waves at 15 to 40 feet, sometimes even 50 feet. Strong, strong hurricanes often exhibit a double eye wall with a moat in between, and we'll talk about that. This is one of, this is 1980, this is one of the first 
concepts of what a slice of that eye wall looks like, and I've taken and reproduced it, so now it's like we cut the, the uh, hurricane in half. That distance between them is probably a little narrower, excuse me, but you can start to see there's arrows on the bottom in both, both diagrams coming together and then going up. And here's a schematic of that. The red line is the air being pulled in, and then it's going up through the eye wall. I'm pointing that out because most people think the air comes in and goes up the eye. No, actually the air in the eye is coming down. Now, this drawing on the left is a, a concept drawing of the, how the winds will come in, and they'll go up the eye and out the top. I'm sorry, up the eye wall and out the top. And the analogy of what's going on, the conservation of angular momentum is like an ice skater. When the, when the winds are coming in at the sea level, they're, go, they're going slower, but when they get pulled into the eye wall, they spin up at a much higher velocity. And here's some radar plots at 1,500, 8,000, and 15,000, et cetera, feet. And you can see that the intense intensity of the hurricane starts to, to wane as we go higher in altitude because we're getting above that uh, active uh, activity in the eye wall. Now this picture on the right, just a minute here, this picture on the right shows even more how complex it is. You see again on the bottom, the air is coming in the bottom and it's going up in the eye wall and once it gets to the top, most of it's exhausted but some of it is coming back down and I'm gonna be explaining that in just a sec. And the last thing I wanna talk about in this segment are the spiral rain bands. To Floridians or Texans or people who live down here where they've exper experienced hurricanes, this is the first thing we actually experience are the rain bands. And they can extend out 100 to 500 miles. And up, miles. They are intense organized thunderstorms, once again, with shower cells. Uh, st st uh, stratiform precipitation structure is in between the bands. We say there are primary and secondary bands. Uh, the thunderstorms have heavy rain, strong winds, and sometimes tornadoes. Also, uh, convective bands and straight uh, hurricane squall lines. I'm going to show you more of that in a minute. Now, here's, a t here's two typical plots of a, of a hurricane. We notice that part around the outside is, is the uh, rain band, beginning of the rain band. And on the one on the right, you notice there's two eye walls. And there's, I show the moat in between them. Most hurricanes go through what's called an eye wall recycle, uh, uh, recycle period or renewal period where the outside eye wall absorbs the inside eye wall and for a while the intensity of the hurricane decreases and then it increases again. Here's another shot of a similar hurricane where you can see squall lines towards the outer right, the, the distant eye walls and other things out there. And those, that's what we experience first when the storm's coming with us. Now, in the same way I did a, last time I was here when I was talking about thunderstorms, why? Why does all this happen? Well, first off, the sun is the primary source of energy for all weather on Earth, especially for uh, hurricanes. However, water is the dynamite of severe weather. No water, no hurricane, no tornado, no hail, no nothing. We've got to have moisture or water in the air. Now, in, in the case of a hurricane, we've got to talk about two kinds of heat transfer. Sensible heat transfer is the, tra is, the, is the thing you've already witnessed in just general life, where when you pick up a pan on the stove and you feel the heat in your hand, that's, you're sensing the heat. That's sensible heat uh, conduction through, through conduction, through holding it. Next one is radiation coming off a fireplace or coming off the burner. But the other kind of heat transfer is what we call latent heat transfer. It's where there's a, a change of state from a gas to a liquid or a liquid to a gas, and the heat uh, moves, the heat's transferred. Best example is if, if you've come out of a swimming pool or out of the water, no matter what the temperature is outside, you feel colder, you feel cool, even if the sun's on you, because, because the um, evaporation of that water takes energy from the human body, so that cools you. And in reverse, when that water condenses, heat is given off. 
If you go to a fast food place and get a drink with a lot of ice and go outside in the summer, you'll see there's all kinds of water on the outside of the cup. Well, that's the moisture, vapor, the water vapor in the atmosphere condensing on the cup. But what you don't realize, it's giving off heat. It's, it's hard to sense and hard to measure. Now, uh, in meteorology, we talk about an imaginary blob or partial of air. And back to my quick analogy, we're now at the beach. This is South Daytona. That car on the left, that blue car is our car. We, we have our towels inside. We go out swimming for an hour. We come back and we open the door of that car. It's probably around 180 degrees Fahrenheit in that car. And the minute we do, a blob of air comes out of the car and starts rising up just like a hot air balloon. And that air is hot, it, that's, it's less dense than the surrounding air, and that makes it buoyant. But it's only going to go up to, say, 5,000 feet, where it equalizes with the surrounding air, and that's it. Nothing more happens. Now, we come out of the water, and we dry off, and we have all those wet towels. We throw them in the car to walk down the, the beach and get a hot dog, and the, we close the car again, and we're gone for an hour. This time, when we come back, once again, the air comes out, but it's now fully saturated from the water, from all those towels. So not only is it less dense, it's moist, and it's uh, still buoyant with the surrounding air. And this time, when it gets up to around 5,000 feet or whatever the dew point uh, profile is for that atmosphere, that water is going to come out, and there's going to be a cloud. That's the beginning of a cloud and a thunderstorm and a hurricane. And here's what those levels are defined. The first one is the lifting condensation level. That's where the first dew point takes place. If there's no inversion, we get positive buoyancy that we call the level of free con convection. And the air that can, the, the transfer of the latent heat into the atmosphere can cause the air to get going 50 to 100 miles an hour until it gets up to the top of the tropopause where it's, it's lost all its energy. This creates a sea breeze, and I pointed out last time on the bottom slide, what makes Florida unique is it gets two sea breezes as a result of that function, and thus if there were no other weather systems in the state of Florida area, the air would rise and we'd have thunderstorms down the middle every day. So what I just described on the lower left drawing, is there's the state of Florida, is called convergence. On the right, we see uh, thermals, people flying or flying gliders know about thermals. On the top right, we have frontal lifting of air. There's no fronts involved with hurricanes. And on the left, we have mountains. So there's no mountains in the water. There's no frontals. There's no land normally. So where's, where's, it, where's the hurricane going to get its energy to do its thing? Originally, there was a theory called CISC, conditional instability is the second kind. That theory was kicked around for about 20 years, and finally they realized there was no evidence for it. Today, the theory is called wind-induced sur surface heat exchange, and it's the exact same thing, or so to speak, when we eat food, it's hot, we take it in a spoon, and we go to blow that heat off to cool it down. That's what's happening in a hurricane, and we now know this because of that red thing. That is a sail drone. In 2002, one was launched underneath a hurricane eye wall, and this is what, this is what it saw. We actually see, for the first time, we're looking at about 95 miles an hour wind blowing on the water, causing it to foam, encouraging the, the spray, and that will evaporate much either. And once it evaporates, it can be pulled into the air that's going aloft and condense the air. Let's see if I can stop this now. Now, hurricane formation. In the June and July, it's primarily off the coast of the, off the Gulf of Mexico. August and September are the biggest hurricane t uh, times of the season, and things are coming off the coast of Africa. De they develop over Africa. That's another talk. And by October and November, it's shifting back over into near the Caribbean. Just like a thunderstorm has stages, the cumulus stage, the mature stage, and the dissipating stage, the hurricane has those stages too. The first one is a tropical di disturbance, which in, in this example, we're assuming it's the end of the season, which developed over, developed over Africa. Eventually, when rotation starts, we call it a, a tropical depression. When the winds get at least 39 miles an hour, it's a tropical storm. And the, when the winds get at least 74 miles an hour, it's a hurricane. Notice the equator is the line at the bottom of this drawing. If you're on the equator, we can't have a hurricane because there's no, there's no Coriolis effect, there's no spin. 
This is a quick look at all the hurricanes we know of that have been plotted near the United States. But don't let that fool you. Hurricanes don't all just go up the coast. They loop, they come back on themselves, and tropical storms go where the planetary winds they're embedded takes them. And that includes high and low pressure centers affecting them. The tracks can wobble, turn, make loops, wiggle, curve back, curve back and forth. And uh, so that's the effect. When do they occur? This is a plot from 1944 to 2020. We all know 9-11 from the terrorist attack. 9-10 is when the most likely time is to have a hurricane. That doesn't mean we're going to have one on that day. That's just the most likely statistical date. Hurricane formation can take, take place anytime. There's at least warm tropical water of at least 80 degrees down 200 feet. The official season in the United States is June 1 through November 30th. Most tropical storms form late summer, early or early autumn, which is August and September. Hurricane lifespan, the average is 10 days to two weeks. Some would last a month. Average six hurricanes a year affect the North Atlantic and Caribbean. Um, like I said, worldwide, 80 to 90 tropical cyclones a year. Average size, 300 miles, which is the length of the Florida Peninsula. Uh, but they range from 100 to 500 miles. All cyclones are different. All hurricanes are different and unique. Uh, what do we got to have? We got to have a pre-existing condition, which is like a wave or an easterly wave coming off the African continent. Uh, got to be north or south of the equator. Got to have adequate energy in the ocean. Uh, SST is a sea surface temperature of 80 degrees to a depth of 200 feet. Sufficiently unstable and moist atmosphere and small vertical shear. Here's Hurricane Charlie. I said they're all unique, all different. Hurricane Charlie acted much like a huge tornado. The tornadic winds were concentrated and it moved really quick across the state of Florida. Here's Hurricane Francis. Hurricane Francis was completely different, much slower, what we would call a more typical wind field of a hurricane. Now here's a, an example of where all these things exist worldwide. Notice that blank area in the middle, that's the equator. That's where we can't have any hurricanes. This is the, now, what about water temperature? This is August 8th. I pulled this off cha uh, Channel 9 in Tampa. Look at the coast of Florida, the west coast. It's 90 degrees. Out in the Gulf of Mexico, it's 87 degrees. Down in the, no, south of Cuba, it's 85 degrees. So the temperature is there. Uh, just quick about wind shear. Wind shear is great for thunderstorms because they need the tilt, but if we get wind shear on a hurricane, it will usually just rip it apart. Here's an example of one of the easterly waves. I'm going to start going fast because I'm out of time. The Bermuda High is here, which helps direct. Okay, so we have two minutes left. So that's two minutes. So, so what I'm giving you is an introduction, but, but remember this picture. This is a picture of North Africa. You can see those blobs. And the theory is that they're generated by the, by the um, Ethiopian highlands. Something's got to cause that to happen. So all these thunderstorm entities, because of the updraft and because of the effect of the Coriolis effect, which is shown here, it's trying to pull on the left-hand uh, middle drawing, it's trying to pull the air in, but because of the Coriolis effect, the winds curve to the right in the northern hemisphere, and by curving to the right, they cause the winds going counterclockwise. Now, the last thing we're gonna do, what causes all the death? Look at this carefully. 49% or 50% of deaths are storm surge. This is, a, these, now, the other thing we caught this year is this picture. A storm chaser placed a GoPro camera on a light pole in um, Fort Myers Beach. And I encourage you to go online and Google Max Olson storm chaser, because he, chaser, he won't allow his video to be put on a presentation like this, but you can watch it on YouTube. You can watch him stand on top the cab of a pickup truck and put this camera up there. He estimates it was about 18 feet. In the lower right-hand corner, that wave is at 18 feet. But what you're going to see is that red house in the background washed away. Storm surge is a combination of sea level, high tide, and the winds blown by the hurricane, and the winds sucked up by the hurricane by the low pressure. This picture is in all hurricane books. It's 1969 Hurricane Camille. At the top, you had a three-story apartment building. At the bottom, you had nothing. 
Last thing I want to say, we always talk about the right front quadrant of a hurricane. The winds in this hurricane are 110 miles an hour. But if the hurricane is tracking 30 miles an hour, on the right hand side, you're going to add that to it and you're going to get 140 mile an hour winds in the right front quadrant. In the left quadrant, you're only going to get 75 mile an hour winds because you are sub subtracting that from the movement of the hurricane. So that was a one hour presentation in 30 minutes. So if you, if you think I left something out, you're right. We appreciate it, George. You have uh, given us a semester's worth of uh, information on hurricanes and packed it into a 30-minute presentation. I appreciate uh, the fact that you've uh, given us a summary. A lot to learn about hurricanes, a lot to be aware of, particularly if you live in Florida or anywhere along the, the coast. And now even our friends in California have a concern about, about hurricanes. Yep. So uh, along with the other presentations you heard today, you can get WINGS credit for knowledge credits for participation in this. So stay tuned at the end of this broadcast. You'll get the super secret code to enter and to uh, um, uh, get credit for, for WINGS. Thank you so much for watching today. We've had three fabulous guests, Mr. Ben Coleman, an aviation mechanic and uh, pilot, Mr. Brad, uh, Brandon Gardner, who is um, uh, ambassador for the ba Islands and Bahamas Tourism, Ministry of Tourism, and now Dr. George Bartuska telling us all about hurricanes. Uh, it's certainly a significant day. We've had a great day, and it's National Aviation Day. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Ron Timmermans with the Florida Aviation Network. It's been a pleasure having you with us. Stay tuned for the next uh, Plane Time.